All right, my friends. Hello, hello. We are here with a new LinkedIn Live liftoff series. This is Taylor, and I am so excited to have Matt Hines on the line with me today to talk about a topic I think near and dear to both of our hearts and probably many sales and marketing people's hearts. What's up, Matt? How you doing? Happy I'm Wednesday. Good. Happy Wednesday. It's Wednesday. All right, we're, we're halfway. We've made it halfway through the yeah. week. Uh, so for anyone who doesn't know you, give us a quick rundown on who you are, what your background is, like what's your what's your deal, man? Oh, um, the joys of live broadcasting. The right? joys of live, live broadcasting. broadcasting from our basements. It's fun. Um, <laughs> We're both in a basement. We both have basement offices. So, you know, you deal with Wi-Fi issues sometimes. You do. This is not I've, I, I interviewed someone late last year. She's a CMO. I can't remember where she was, but where what company she was at. But she was physically in her laundry room. And uh -huh. like if, every time I talk to her, she literally, she's like, we don't have a big house. I got a bunch of kids. I need quiet. I'm sitting next to the washing machine. I'm like, what well, you do, you, whatever you got to do at work. It's fine. Um, yeah. I think you asked me about me, uh, which I don't I usually did. like talking about, but um, yeah. So I'm Matt started Heinz marketing about 13 years ago. You know, I've just, I, I've had a bunch of jobs in B2B sales and marketing and 13 years ago, decided just to kind of do it on my own. Um, so I've been doing that ever since. And you know, get to spend a lot of time just writing, thinking, uh, helping clients think through kind of creating more predictable, sustainable sales pipelines. Awesome. Love it. Well, I'm glad to have you here. And yeah, bear with us. If we lose connection, we'll be back. We'll, we're just going to roll with it. You know, it's all good. <laughs> it's Wednesday. We're going to make it at least halfway through this conversation. How's that? <laughs> Listen, the struggle is real. Right before we started recording, we were talking about things your kids saying to you. And we could have a whole, yeah. like, I mean, this. some of you watching are probably also in Revenue Collective, which is this fantastic online community of, you know, people in B2B sales and marketing. And there is a whole channel called Quarantining with Kids. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's best practices articles, sometimes just a bitch session, quite honestly. Um, yeah. the struggle is real, right? It and it's is. entirely possible the internet is my fault because we're it's a it's at a time it's called a pre pre asynchronous school time. The Xboxing and the streaming might actually be a little out of control here. So you know, yeah, this is yeah. this is we're still we're not out of it yet. We're still as long as we're still broadcasting <laughs> we're from our basements. There's still a level of like we're all getting through this. Exactly. My kids are still in virtual school. So as I'm excited about them, one, going to summer camp soon, and then two, yeah. going back in the fall. Because yeah. yeah, we're like, there's so many of us using the Wi-Fi. They're in school right now. So they're on Zoom. My husband's on, you know, Zoom. And so yeah. everyone's using it. I have two different Wi-Fi services now. And oh, I really, just, wow. Yeah. I, I decided. Want that. Yeah, we just decided we're like, this is the most important thing to us in all of our lives yeah. right now. And so yeah. sometimes I have to flip between the two. And I don't know, we might all be on the same one. So we'll see. It's all good. Everyone, everyone, your family's doing the same thing. Like, like, yeah. we're, all, we're all doing it. <laughs> All right. Well, that, that's another topic. We'll have you back to talk about quarantine riffing, because honestly, like I could go all day on that. But today we're talking about say no to forms, say yes to leads. Yes. And this is something that you and I have kind of talked on before. And I was like, hey, let's get that on air. Let's talk about this more and share yeah. some ideas with more people. Yeah. Let's start with, because you're such an expert in the sales pipeline and building pipeline and converting pipeline. I thought mm -hmm. you were a great person to talk to about this. First off, like, let's start with what are some of the problems with forms? So using forms for lead generation, what are some of the problems you run into? Well, let's start with the problem with forms, which is that it is a construct that is entirely focused on the seller, not the buyer. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you are a buyer, if you are someone that's researching in ideas, researching what you think you should do next, then you don't need to fill out a form like the form is entirely for us as sellers to know who's accessing that information because we want to follow up with them. Well, the prospect may or may not want that follow up at some point. Right. So there are some forms that still clearly make sense. Like if you are if someone's asking for a demo, then putting a form in front of them makes sense. If someone wants to for follow up, like asking them for some information that you can use to for follow up makes sense. If they're simply accessing a white paper or a recording of a, of a presentation somewhere, like why do they need to fill out a form? It's entirely for you as the seller to follow up. And so 
what if in what if for those prospects that are the most interested they are so interested in learning that they want your information they want that thinly veiled sales pitch of a white paper that you're offering on a landing page like why put a barrier in front of them and the reason we do it is because we want to know who they are so we can count it so we can measure it so we can follow up with it well what if you put enough valuable information in front of your prospects that they kept going Mm -hmm. They kept looking for information. They kept researching on your website. And eventually they learned enough that they wanted to reach out and learn more about you authentically on their terms at a point when they are going to respond to your emails. They're going to respond to your phone calls because they want to talk to you. It's a whole different construct. Like it completely changes the whole waterfall model, it completely changes the way you think about all these MQLs I am quote unquote collecting because they filled out a form. <laughs> And it is a far more frictionless process for both sides. It's more, it's frictionless. It's, it's, it's less friction for the prospect because they're able to get what they want when they want. It's less, less friction for the seller because you're not trying to chase down prospects that don't need you. I mean, think about it. When you download a white paper, like you don't need follow up transaction over. I wanted a white paper. You asked for some information. I gave you information. You gave me my white paper. I am done. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you are a seller, what value do you put in front of someone that compels them to want to learn more? So them to spend more time with you, to them to give you more attention. That's not on the buyer to respond to your SDR sequence. That's on you as a seller to be more valuable. Yeah, I love that. Well, and it's we live in a world now where people self-educate so much before they buy things. Right. And so if you make that self-education process easier it's going to do a couple of things. First off, it's going to get you in front of more eyeballs, honestly, because there are a lot of people who just aren't going to fill out the form because they're smart to it. And they're like, I don't want to sign up for a thousand emails. Right. And then uh, two, it's probably going to bring you better customers who are a better fit for your products or services, because if they are educating themselves, they're reading your stuff, they like it, they're in tune to it, and it fits in with what they need and how they think then when they do come to you, I would think it would be, you know, a better, a better fit for a client relationship. Well, just ask yourself, do you want more leads or do you want more opportunities? Yeah. You could also ask, do you want more opportunities or do you want more qualified closed deals? I get it. So we, you know, I mentioned I've been in business for 13 years now. We just finally, like a month ago, hired our first business development manager. And I'm mm. just so excited to have someone because I've just, I've been the sole seller for our company. Right. And I enjoy it. It's fun. But like every inbound lead, like you got to like, you spend time with and you try to qualify what's going on. And I enjoy those conversations. Mm -hmm. But when you're just, when you're doing lead qualification, lead follow up, it's a lot of work. And so mm -hmm. it's awesome to now shout out to Sherry, to have Sherry to able to do that. And quite frankly, she's already doing it better than I did. But I would rather, if I, given a choice, I would rather have fewer leads and more people that are saying, we want to talk to you about what you do. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if I could, if you eliminate forms and just let people access all that content on their own, could you actually have fewer sellers doing mm -hmm. the same, if not more output? Instead of having all of those lead qualification conversations where, hey, I saw you downloaded our white paper. What did you think about that? Like the worst is when someone calls and says, thanks for downloading the white paper. Would you like to see a demo of our product? Like no one yeah. ever says yes to that. Better and something we still teach our clients to do is thanks for downloading the white paper. Why did you do that? <laughs> what mm. about that topic is prescient? What's going on in your business right now that made this white paper worth downloading? And we're adding yourself mm -hmm. to our spam list, quite frankly, to get it. Like, that's a more interesting progression of a conversation. Well, what if you didn't even have to have that? Mm -hmm. What if your BDRs and your sales reps didn't have to have that conversation over and over again? And instead, that could happen through your content, through other experiences that prospect has on your website with your content, with your videos, with your podcast. So they're learning on their own. They're self-educated. We think as sellers, we think self-education is a bad thing. We're like, wow, you, it was better mm. when we could actually educate them. We could be the team. And instead of them doing their own education, what if they're self-educating on your website with mm. your content through your media? And when they finally call you, when they finally fill out that contest us form, they are better educated. They know what they're looking for. They have better questions. They have been better self-qualified. Like, if you don't believe that that's possible, then what you're telling me is you think your prospects are dumb. 
Mm. And you think your prospects have to be guided at the early stages of this process by your 22 year old BDR. Right. And I just fundamentally don't believe that. Yeah. I love it. Well, it's interesting that it's the way marketing's always been done in the B2B Mm -hmm. space. But when you really think about it, it's not the way that it's been done in the B2C space. I don't need a BDR to call me up to ask me if I'm going to go buy my, you know, powder or my blush or my lipstick again. I just see a commercial. I like the color and I go and I buy it and then I try it. And if I like it, I keep buying it. Right. Um, So it's interesting that it's like that's the way that B2B is done. And I don't think and it works in the B2C space differently. And I think it can work in B2B, too. So but it's why is that? So let's, let's, let's dig into that. Yeah, why, why, why do consumer, why do CPG companies not do it? And yeah. yet, you know, cloud, cloud computing companies and SaaS companies do it. I think there's I a know. simple answer. It's, yeah. What is it's what economics? Think? Yeah. I think it's economics. Like you can't, you could, you, as, if you're a CPG company, if you're a cosmetics company, you can't afford to have a BDR call you to ask you about your blush. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The math doesn't I really, really don't work out. To. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it, well, actually, the, let's, let's look. It, it, the math might work out because uh, you know the because blush is a consumable, right? Like you're not going to mm-hmm. buy. It's not like a car that you're going to buy it and then 15 years later buy another one. Like you're going to use it, you know, and then need to buy more. But still, like the math doesn't work out, so you never do this. You have to do it a different way. Mm. Part of the reason we justify saying let's fill out forms and have BDRs follow up. Um, is because we can afford to do it because mm-hmm. the deal is worth it. It's worth it for you. Your spreadsheet may say you can just, you know, just run and gun and call your prospects like 14 times to get a small conversion rate that on paper looks good. But I mean, how many times do you see in LinkedIn and on Slack groups, like legit B2B buyers complaining over and over about the buying experience? Mm hmm. And just look yourself in the mirror and say, are we one of those? Yeah. And you may be hitting your short-term number by doing scorched earth call as many prospects as possible. But I guarantee you that there is a compounding negative brand equity that you are building with that finite universe of prospects that have not bought from you. But when they think of you, they think of those bad buying experiences at the top mm-hmm. of the funnel. Um, that may not impact you this month, this quarter, but if you continue on that process, if you continue with that approach, it will bite you eventually. Yeah. I love it. All right. So let's get into tips that you have. Okay. So if like forms aren't always the way to go. Right. And I agree. Like, yeah, if you're specifically sending someone to a, get a demo page, totally makes sense. Right. That's something or start a project with us. Right. Like it's very specific. They're already down the pathway on that Mm -hmm. mission. Right. Mm -hmm. But let's say that, I don't know, like how else, what are, what are your three to five tips for getting leads without forms and your general marketing and your, you know, broad scale mass marketing? What, what are some things that you've run into that you think work? One of my favorite marketing books ever is called Scientific Advertising. And it was written mm-hmm. by Claude Hopkins. And it was written in like 1921. Like it's a very old book. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just, it is universal just direct marketing best practices. And one of the things he says that is not unique, as a lot of people have said it since, is don't give people a free sample, offer them a free sample. Don't, you know, don't hand them out to anyone on the street. Like, you know, sometimes you go to, back when we could walk around the streets of New York without masks and stuff, right? Every once in a while you'd Mm -hmm. see someone just like handing out samples. What a random, you know, sort of imprecise way of getting your product to a target market. If you offered someone to receive a sample, you get them to request it. You get a subset of your market that actually cares enough about it to say, yes, I would like to have that. And so how do you, how does that apply to a B2B context? Um, I've always really loved the HubSpot example from back in the day when they would offer the website optimizer. Like they do, Mm -hmm. HubSpot has, you know, was, was phenomenal at creating just reams of content. Like if you wanted to, I mean, what better if you say, I want to learn about content marketing, where should I go? Mm -hmm. Well, the company selling me content marketing software also happens to have some of the best content on content marketing, 
you know, so you're spending a lot of time with them to begin with. And then they're like, oh, they're going to help figure out what, you know, how to make my website better. Well, I want to fill out this form to learn about that. Right. So I've got an authentic reason to give someone information. So I get something meaningful back. Mm -hmm. Now that is a great two way value prop where HubSpot learns about the company and how bad their website is and is able to provide some consultative feedback on how to make it better. Mm -hmm. And the, and the prospect, the buyer, gets some insights they didn't have before that on their own might make them smarter, better. On their own, they might be able to go make their, web, their, their stuff better. So it's, 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 it's instead of sort of just randomly throwing out like webinars and white papers and just following up for no reason, like the tra where the transaction's over, there's an expectation from the prospect that they're going to get something. They're mm -hmm. waiting for you to respond. They are waiting with bated breath for you to give them something. Like it's a great example. Every business has that opportunity. What insights can you create? Can you create a program that at scale, those 22 year old BDRs can take a certain amount of information, run it through a little machine or spreadsheet on your end and provide insights back to that prospect. So they learn something. So they want to learn more from you so that you or they know can orchestrate a next step that makes sense mm -hmm. for both sides as well. Um, mm -hmm. It takes a little more work, right? It's more than just like writing a white paper, throwing up a web page and hoping people fill out a form to get your white paper. Like it, it takes more work, but it's worth it. And you will get better, more qualified, more interested, more engaged prospects as a result of that. Yeah. And you're giving the prospect an opportunity to experience what it's like working with you and what they get out of working with you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Uh, I've used some of those tools too. Like Google has done a good job with, you know, tools like that things where you can very easily self-serve and get a little bit of information like free tools, you know, mm -hmm. are, are there any other examples that you've seen that you think work really well for B2B prospecting? Like, let's say you are an agency. Mm -hmm. What are some things that you think you can do to drive traffic and to drive leads without any form fills like at all? Let's say completely no to forms. Uh, start a podcast and invite your prospects to be guests. Mm. Right. Um, I mean, just just, you know, full disclosure, that's been a part of our strategy with sales pipeline radio for years, you know, where, you know, we want. Just authentically, we want great content on our podcast. We want great B2B sales and marketing thinkers. You can be an author. You can have done it for 100 years. But you can also be someone who's new to the scene, who's just doing some interesting mm -hmm. things. Like, we just want to highlight good stories. But we also, you know, want to highlight those stories from companies we think as a consulting firm we could do business with. And so we mm -hmm. will invite the CMOs from our prospects to be part of the show. And especially once you get a little gravity to a show, oh, here's some other people that have been on it. Here's a, you know, salespipelineradio.com. It sort of shows you what other people have done and sort of makes it look like semi-professional. Um, you know, people are maybe more likely to sort of come and do it. And then you get to a point where you can not just pitch the CMO, you can pitch their PR firm. Like we daily, mm. I never expected this when we started the podcast. We, people think it's, I mean, people treat it like a media channel. Like we, every day mm. we get PR pitches from companies that want their clients on the show. And so I can now go to the PR firm of my prospect and say, like, would you like, you know, your client to be on this? Like, make it their win so they go pitch it for me. Yeah. So there are a bunch of ways to do this, right? Like, we did a video series last fall on um, called the Unpredictable Pipeline. And we invited marketing leaders to come on and talk about you know, amidst 2020s craziness, like what are they doing to try to create more predictability in a very unpredictable year? Um, we're about to kick off a new interview series called Marketing Difference Makers. Uh, it actually starts next week where we are taking not the CMOs, we're taking the unsung heroes in organizations and we're highlighting mm -hmm. their stories, right? And so again, like I am, I am, I am engaging with prospects. I'm engaging with people I want to do business with by making them the hero. Mm -hmm. by giving them the spotlight, by giving them an opportunity to tell their story. And if I ask the right questions, my interview, my podcast episode, my video recording, my LinkedIn live is my discovery call, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm, you know, so I'm, I'm understanding better what that company is doing. I'm giving them an opportunity to shine. I'm creating more content and more of a paper trail of what I'm thinking about and what we're trying to encourage and what we are spotlighting 
to help people build predictable pipeline. Like there's many wins along the way here. Like the leverage opportunity on that is significant. Now, is that scalable to, you know, enormous markets? Maybe not. But like I said before, like, would you rather have more leads or more opportunities? Would you rather have more opportunities mm -hmm. or more closed deals? Like mm -hmm. the numbers at the bottom of the funnel are more important than numbers at the top. You don't have to play the quantity numbers game. Like, just get more precise at who you're reaching out to, get more precise at what your value proposition is. Um, you can make that all work. It's not rocket science. I'm a very small company working out of my basement right now. <laughs> if I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> Well, I mean, from one basement to another, you're speaking my marketing love language, you know, because I agree. Like, and a lot of what I heard in that is it's about relationship building, about higher quality opportunities. Yeah. Instead, yeah. I think what happens is oftentimes at companies, and tell me what you think about this, there's this expectation to show a certain number, right? to the CEO, to the board, to whomever. Yeah. And so you try to fill the funnel with the biggest number that you can because you think that that's what you need to do. Right. But just because that number is huge sometimes, a lot of times it's what I refer to as vanity metrics. A lot of those oh. MQLs that you talk about, right? Because yep. it's like, yeah, the number looks big. How many of those people actually need what you're doing or are or, or close to buying it like at all, right. right? And so that's what I like what you're saying about, it's more about opportunities than leads. Yeah, yeah, I think I love that you, I love that you called out MQLs as a vanity metric. So I think mm -hmm. when people think about vanity metrics and market, they think, oh, it's your clicks and likes, it's your web traffic. It's a, yeah, those can all be vanity metrics too, but depending on how you define your leads, just an MQL, like someone that raised their hand, right? And look, I, we all yeah. live in glass. We all live in glass houses. I still have too many forms on my website, right? Yeah. Like I have, I have glorified the MQL in my past. We've mm -hmm. all done this. But if you look objectively at what really matters, and I think the bigger we grow and the more we do this ourselves as well, you know, the more we sort of drink our own champagne and realize, no, this is this is a broken way of doing this. Yeah. And when it's my budget and my money going to fund these inefficient programs that are chasing after metrics that don't matter, there's a better way of doing this. It's not always an easier yeah. way. Um, and that better right. way may take a new level, a new discipline or a new process, a new skill set inside your organization. Um, but chase the numbers at the bottom of the funnel, not the numbers at the top. Uh, and you'll mm -hmm. always be in better shape. I love that. All right, just to, to close this out, like any any other last final thoughts you have on how to get people over the hump of trying a no form methodology? Like maybe just start with one or two things, you know, like any yeah. any tips to get people kind of like over the edge in their minds where they're maybe too scared not to have a form on something or they need well, to get buy-in to their boss to try a no form methodology. Well, you just, you just, you just, you just said it, right? I think, you know, one is, you know, find a test market where you can A-B test this. Like, don't rip the Band-Aid off and take all your forms off today. Like, you are going to, like, it may be the right thing to do, but you're going to freak out your sales team. You're going to freak out your <laughs> CEO. You're going to freak out your board. Like, I mean, like you said earlier, like, everyone is so addicted to that up and to the right chart of more leads, more leads, more leads. Yeah. It's going to take some work to create not just a marketing strategy change, but a culture change in your organization. So start small, start with a new campaign, start with, you know, that next, that next program you were planning to do that next white paper you were launching that next webinar you were going to offer webinars are different. Like web webinars are a little different in that, like, you know, you want people to register because people want the calendar invite people want to sort of have mm -hmm. something. So there's a value exchange there for sure. Yeah. Whether people that attend a webinar are qualified is a different story. Just because they attended your last four webinars doesn't mean they're qualified. It might mean they're bored. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so have an objective measure of whether or not, you know, those people actually are interesting, um, interesting to you and have some interest in moving forward. But, yeah, find a place where you can sort of isolate sort of a, a test group that is less focused on lead volume volume and more focused on middle of funnel metrics. None of this is going to work long term unless you get your counterparts in, mar in sales, as well mm -hmm. as your boss and your leadership team and your CEO behind this change. That is not a 20 minute conversation. Mm -hmm. That is not an email. 
it's going to take a series of conversations, right? But I think if you can get the team to buy off on the fact that the bottom metrics are more important than the top, that marketing is going to really start measuring itself based on bottom funnel metrics, that both sales and marketing are going to agree that they are going to pursue and prioritize daily, weekly efforts on metrics you can buy a beer with, then you're off to, off to the races. Again, that is mm -hmm. going to take some time to work. But I think in parallel, while you have those conversations, isolate some programs and test doing something without forms entirely, knowing that the output is going to look very different initially. But the long term output, I, I bet, is more efficient for the entire organization, not just marketing. Yeah, love it. Awesome. Hey, this has been good. And Kim, hey, Kim, I'm glad you're here. Good to see you, too. I uh, hope this was helpful to anyone who tuned in today. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you, I mean, I recommend they follow you on LinkedIn. You're always putting good stuff out there. Like, what are some other ways to follow along, learn more about you and what uh, Heinz Marketing is doing? Yeah, I just, I get, I talk and type a lot from my basement here. So, um, <laughs> you know, I don't do as much blogging. We've been trying to get, we got more people on the team that are spending more time on our blog. Um, but LinkedIn for sure. I'm trying to post a lot of good stuff on LinkedIn, salespipelineradio.com for our podcast. Um, I'm trying to do more LinkedIn lives uh, and community things as well. If you happen to be in Revenue Collective, I'm up there too. And I'm also just Matt, M-A-T-T -T, at HeinzMarketing.com. Um, yeah, I just, the more of these conversations I have, the more I have with people that, you know, are sort of that I'm learning from, or the people that are sort of coming with their sort of more traditional worldview. And we're trying to figure out a path forward. God, those conversations are so valuable, right? Just because there's so mm -hmm. many different ways. There isn't a single way this all works. You know, I think you got to take a lot of variables and come up with a unique position. So love learning. Um, I think content creation is a part of learning, you know, taking something you don't understand and figuring out how to articulate it. So um, yeah, welcome those conversations anytime. Awesome. Cool. Well, hey, next time we'll, we'll schedule a quarantine, um, <clears throat> you know, grief session or something. Oh my God. Like Listen, that. so we do, um, I think I mentioned we do this CMO group on Friday mornings and yeah. we call it this, the it's called CMO Coffee Talk, but we kind of informally call it first sip club and we say first sip yeah. club is about coffee and learning every once in a while we will have a last sip club like we'll have a happy hour we say first sip club is for coffee and learning last sip club is for liquor and complaining so yeah. if you want to do like a quarantining <laughs> with your family liquor and complaining show i am game anytime let's do it let's do it yes. that's the the last sip was what you need to invite me to because here's the thing like i'm on your <laughs> Real talk here, like I'm on your list for the CMO Coffee Club and I barely ever make it because that's normally yeah. when I'm trying to be like, get up. Yes. Get yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. You know, you are welcome. And I know you're welcome to join me for the earlier one. It sounds like you are. You're probably signed up for the Pacific. We do at 8 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific. Yeah. And so um, if you because you're are you're East Coast, right? I'm East Coast. Yeah. So yeah. I it's the 8 a.m. one that I'm just barely like. Yeah, I know. Trying if, to get yeah, things no, together I, well, for the I'm, day. I'm in Seattle, so you can imagine how I am at 5 a.m. every Friday oh, trying gosh. to get through that yeah. one. Um, but 11 p 11 a.m. Eastern, we're doing another version that is sort of tends to be more ah. West Coast folks. But like, I'm assuming like okay. coffee's kicked in, kids are on their Zooms. You're welcome to join us. Yeah, yeah. Send me that one. I'll start showing up. <laughs> All right, done. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, Matt, thank you so much. If you need help with your sales pipeline, call Matt because that's what he's a pro at and his team will fix you up with all that good stuff and help you say no to forms and yes to leads. All right, folks, I'll see you next time. Thanks, Matt. You kicked off the series. This is the brand new liftoff series. And, Look at uh, you too with the, 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 all the, the branding. I can, can get the branding that. up here. Like I love it. It looks great. Well, that's the one thing in the world I'm good at. So yeah. I just, you know, <laughs> stick to that. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you handle the sales pipeline stuff, you know, <laughs> do the branding. <laughs> Perfect. All right. We'll see you next time, people. Thank you. Bye, Matt.